You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. So we, um, in our last time together, we finished the introduction for chapter 2. Um, this is the chapter where the dream, Nebuchadnezzar's dream starts clear up in verse 31. And all of this other, verse, the first 30 verses are important, I assure you, to set the stage for how God puts Daniel in a position of being the only person that Nebuchadnezzar could look to to understand this dream that was causing him trouble. So we're going to, uh, we're going to be reading chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Now, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conquer, the, the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to him, spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The command from me is firm. If you do not make make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell the dream to his servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time inasmuch as you have seen that I have the command from me is firm, so that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered, <clears throat> the Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king, inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conqueror, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult, and there is no one else who could declare it to the king except gods, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. Because of this, the king became indignant and very furious and gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. <clears throat> so Daniel, as it were, came out of the frying pan in chapter 1 and finds himself in the fire in chapter 2. It ended, chapter 1 ended with great promise. Um, so we're going to see how God uses this situation to set up, how, set up the um, the occasion and the circumstances which will lead to the king actually not killing the astrologers and the conjurers and the true wise men and needing Daniel to interpret his dream. So let's start with verse 1. Now, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. At this point in the life of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar has his dream which troubles him. Daniel 2.29 explains that uh, explains that Nebuchadnezzar, as he was falling asleep, would be questioning what was going on in the future, what was going to happen in the future, and in this and this dream was a result of that. <clears throat> so in, Jap- in Daniel chapter two twenty nine, it says, "As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future, and he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place." So Daniel explains later on to Nebuchadnezzar why he was having these sleepless nights. Now the word translated dreams can mean simple dreams in, 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 uh, in Hebrew, or it can mean prophetic dreams. The word that is translated troubled depicts a tr- uh, severe disturbance inducing apprehension, loss of, apprehensive loss of sleep. 
He, had, he was losing sleep. He couldn't sleep. Have any of you been troubled by that ever before? You couldn't sleep? It is just not fun, is it? Now imagine it occurring night after night. And you have these, when you do fall asleep, you have these dreams that are just frightening and disturbing. And this was in a time when societies gave far more substance to dreams. When I have weird dreams, I figure it was the way I ate the hamburger. Or why I ate the hamburger. Why did I eat that hamburger? Or there wasn't enough bacon involved or something. But uh, I don't know about you, but I most often can't even remember most of my dreams. Um, although if something happens, it might trigger, oh yeah, I remember dreaming that last night or something, you know, dreaming something about that. But this, these were sleep-depriving, frightening uh, dreams that caused great apprehension. He was agitated. <clears throat> and so when we see later on his reaction to the astrologers and the Chaldeans, we can kind of understand it just from a natural point of view that he was not sleeping well. And when you're not sleeping well, it kind of puts you out of sorts. Well, if you're a king of an empire and you're out of sorts, people might die. <laughs> so when we're out of sorts, we just, somebody else has to cook breakfast. So now we turn to the issue raised by the critics related to this period of training that Daniel had in which he was to be under the king's training for three years. And we read the very first verse of Daniel chapter 2, and it says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, now wait a minute. Didn't Daniel and his friends, weren't they put into training for three years before they could be advisors? They're going to be killed because they're advisors to the king. Later on, we're going to see in a few verses. But only two years have passed. And so that was one of the very first things that the critics raised objections to as soon as they got into chapter 2. The problem disappears when you understand that ancient kingdoms, and especially the Babylonians, used the first year of a king's reign. They called it his accession year. It did not count as his first year. It was his year of arising to the throne, the accession year. Thus, Nebuchadnezzar's first year didn't count as his first year by our reckoning. The chart shows how this works. So, May to June of 605 B.C., Babylonian victory over the Egyptians at Carchemish. June to August of 605, surrender of Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel and his companions are taken captive. September 7, 605, Nebuchadnezzar, the general of the army, made king over Babylon um, after the death of his father, his father Nabopolassar. September 7, again, to April 1, 604, September 7, 605, B.C. to April 1, 604 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar's accession year as king and the first year of Daniel's training. This is his accession year, not by their reckoning, his first year, his accession year. April 2nd, 604 to March 21, 603 B.C., first year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar and the second year of Daniel's training. March 23, 603 B.C. to April 9, 602 B.C., the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar and the third year of the training of Daniel and the year of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. And that's very simply how the, the timing worked out in those days. They wouldn't count the first year as his first year. It was called his accession year. So chapter 1, as we just read, had ended with great promise for Daniel, and chapter 2 begins with danger. There's the object, there's the uh, apparent possibility that Daniel and his friends could be killed. And in this particular case, they were completely innocent. We're going to find out they weren't even present when the Chaldeans couldn't lie to the king. So any questions about verse 1 or that accession year, the first year, the second year, or the third year of their training? <clears throat> verse 2, Then the king gave orders to call the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. Now, <clears throat> in those days, a king would have a dream. And you have to understand there's an awful lot of interplay going on and an awful lot of fake, fake things happening um, because the conjurers, the sorcerers, the magicians, and the Chaldeans would first be concerned about their own skin. How are we going to stay alive in this, in this uh, administration, if you will? And so a king would tell them his dreams, and then they would take some time, they would go away, and they would consult together. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? 
How are you going to interpret this stupid thing he's saying to us? I mean, can you believe the king likes potato chips, you know, or something like that? So then they would come to a conclusion together, and they would come back, and they would interpret the dream. Interpret the dream. <clears throat> In so much so that I would suggest that when Nabopolassar, Nebuchadnezzar's father, had this done, his son, Nebuchadnezzar, would have seen some of this happening. And he would have begun to develop his own opinions about the intelligence, the efficacy, and the truthfulness of the soothsayers, the conjurers, and the magicians that were in Nebuchadnezzar's court, or Nabopolassar's court. Now, he didn't have any say over them, but picture this. While he's going out and fighting his father's battles, and sometimes he's at home, he's seeing his father having dreams interpreted, because that's what was done in those days, and he would have developed his own opinions about these people that were interpreting the dreams. So verse 2, the king calls, the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. So they came in and stood before the king. So now, I don't know what was going through Nebuchadnezzar's head, but he would probably have remembered some of the things that had happened with his father doing these very things, same things. So the king calls in the four classes of the advisors that he has. The first would be magicians. This is a translation of the Hebrew word with the root meaning of the idea of a stylus or a pen, a writing instrument. That's where the word comes from. These were writers. This could mean magician, but it could also simply mean scholar, uh, educator. Conjurers translates the Hebrew word which refers to those who consult the dead. And we know how effective that is. It was no more effective then than it is today. It can also mean astrologers, which is the preferred meaning here. The Hebrew word translated sorcerers refers to those who use incantations and magic, witches, warlocks, etc. And the final word translated Chaldeans is, a, is from a word which designates the people which lived in southern Babylonia. These people would have considered themselves a master race. <clears throat> there is ample scholarship that dra- demonstrates that this word translated Chaldeans is a homonym. Which and and can can simply be translated Chaldeans, referring to their master rate trait, master race trait, or it can be translated astrologer priest. It is similar to the differences between the meanings of the words two, two, and two, or what we see all the time on Facebook: there, there, and there. Those are homonyms. They sound the name, but they ha- they sound the same. They have different words. T two, T O expresses in the direction of, I'm going to town. Two, T-O-O, expresses addition, also, more. I'm going to town too. (laughs) I'm going to town as well. The word two, T-W-O, is a cardinal, where, where am I at here? It describes a cardinal number, and yet all three are pronounced exactly the same. The two, let's see, I'm going to town too. That's two of us going to town (laughs) too. So all the words sound the same, but they have different meanings, some somewhat radical different meanings. This is the word for Chaldean. It is a homonym, and it can have several. It can be translated in two different ways. (laughs) The Chaldeans were not only um, astrologers. They were actually very accomplished astronomers. And uh, as well, and were quite famous with their accuracy and predictions of planetary movements and such. Um, it, it's it's these kinds of things are very evident when we look at things like Stonehenge, and you see how accurate they were able to place rocks and things so that they would show the rising sun on, during the vernal equinox or or whatever it is that Stonehenge does. I think that's what I remember it doing. Um, so their ability to to calculate planetary movements was legendary. Um, So, it is well to note that Daniel and his three friends were not consulted. They weren't consulted in this. The astrologers, the conjurers, the magicians, and the Chaldeans that came forward were the older men in the king's court. So Daniel, they would have been, Daniel and his three friends would have been considered in the lower class of counselors because they had just finished their training and they were too young. The advisors the king called in would have been the older established cabal, if you will. Um, he would not have looked to the young people yet. They would have had to have some opportunity to study to be in, to mix in with the current crop of advisors and watch them work and develop their own ability to help consult the king, or excuse me, um, 
advise the king. So any questions on verse 2? Verse 3, the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. This would have been a skittish, troubled Nebuchadnezzar, and people who knew him, who came in to stand before him, would have known something uh, something was up. I'm, I'm, uh, this is not explicitly in Scripture, but understanding how these kinds of things work, they would have thought to themselves, King seems upset, he seems agitated. And that can mean a whole different thing in this kind of a, a, um, a culture than it would today. The dream had clearly unsettled him, and he was in something of a hurry to find out what it, would have, what it might have meant from his trusted, his trusted advisors. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. So here begins the Aramaic portion of Daniel. And it runs from here, chapter 2, verse 4, all the way through chapter 7, verse 28. The people of Babylonia spoke in Aramaic. It was the, it was the business language. It was the cultural language. Their documents were written in Aramaic. And so Daniel wrote this portion of the book in the language of the kingdom. An interesting bit of trivia reminds us that, uh, and I didn't know this, that Aramaic was, was called Chaldean until the late 1800s. And then they changed the name to Aramaic. The Chaldeans took the lead in this situation when he calls the advisors in and gave the king a standard greeting and replied with the normal request that they be given the details of the dream so that they could interpret him for, uh, interpret it for him. So, O King Live Forever was designed to, it was, it was the, uh, your honor. May we, may we hear your request. It was a, a, a statement of, of, um, dignity. They gave to the king dignity and responsibility, and they, they told him, they were telling him with that statement that they were his subjects to command. <clears throat> Any questions about two or three, three or four? I mean, verse three or four. So verse five. The king replied to the Chaldeans, the command from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. The King James translates this first. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If you will not make known to me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. From this phraseology, some of it have interpreted it to mean that the king had forgotten his dream, it is, that it had gone from him. It is much more likely that the translation here in the New American Standard and in the um, English Standard Version is more accurate. He gave them a command to interpret the dream without giving them the details of the dream. They came back with a response asking for the detail of the dream, and the king is saying, hey, my command went forth from me. You heard what I said. You need to do as I said. Tell me what this dream meant. Now, put yourself in that position. You've been lying to this king most of the time for probably upwards, and his father, okay, to his father first, for probably upwards of 20 years. You've been making things up out of whole cloth that sounded very... You, you've, you've come up with methodology and phraseology and science that backs it up in those days. And now you're being put on the spot to do, to do the very thing you've been doing for 20 years, but without the benefit of any information about what you're supposed to interpret. <laughs> Would you be bargaining for your life if you were a liar? You wouldn't because you're all Christians. So, I can't, can, can you, the, probably the color drained out of their faces, their weak knees got weak, because when he said torn limb from limb, I thought about describing what that meant. I looked up some of what the Babylonians did. It is gruesome, and I chose not to describe it this morning, because maybe your sleep would go from you. Just understand that when he says tearing you limb from limb, that's what he meant, and these guys knew what he meant, and it was not, it would be painful. So the king was saying, listen, I gave you a command. I said I had a dream. I've asked you to interpret it so that I can understand it. Interpret it now, or you will die. (laughs) So it's actually not possible to determine for sure whether he had forgotten it or not. So we have to look for clues. And one of the positions in favor of that is that the king, being very anxious to know its interpretation, he would have certainly divulged it to his advisors, would he not, if he was really that intent on understanding it. In either instance, the advisors were put on the spot. 
We can only speculate why Nebuchadnezzar would have put the question to his advisors this way. It is very possible, as I mentioned earlier, that his interactions with them when his father was alive left him with a bad taste in his mouth, seeing them unable, unable to divulge great secrets that his father might have wanted to know. He may have had a desire to be old, rid of the older counselors and surround himself with younger men, as King Solomon's son Rehoboam had done. He may have been suspicious of their superstitions. The angst generated by this dream may have rendered him less tolerant than usual. And, and Babylonian kings were not known for their tolerance in the first place. So, in any event, the advisors were given an impossible task, and they knew it. At the time that they were, they were known, at the time, by the way, there were known what was, there were what were known as dream manuals. Now you can imagine what that is. That the Chaldeans used, but it took, took an expert to even know how to navigate through the dream manuals looking for a particular type of dream and the corresponding suggested interpretation. Since these manuals attempted to cover every possible eventuality that could occur in a dream, they were unbelievably long. The statement that he would tear them from limb from limb was common, and, and the perverse rulers of that day used it and often carried it out. So they would have been hurriedly wanting to consult their dream manuals. They were not going to be given that opportunity. Now imagine, though, so we have the Bible. This is our manual, if you will, of operation. It is our way to glorify and honor God. It is truth. So they would have had books and books and books written about how to interpret different kinds of dreams. Well, if he dreams about this, then here are the 23 possibilities that that dream meant. Pick one of these. If he dreams about this and this and that, then here are the et cetera, et cetera, ad, ad infinitum, ad nauseum. And they would have had compiled these over the centuries, and they would have been consulted. They were not going to be given that opportunity. Now, there would have been many of them that would have known this was all a farce but there would have been some of them that really believed what they were doing. It's the same back then as it is today. People believe lies sometimes just to make themselves more comfortable. Sometimes they know their lies. Sometimes they don't know their lies. But these were all lies. These manuals were fake. They were interpretation methods and, and information that had been compiled over the years for, for uh, a continued fooling of those you were interpreting the dreams for. Now they're dealing with a ruthless, um, arbitrary ruler, if you will, and they have no opportunity to even consult the things that they're normally, they normally can consult. So he says, if you don't give me the interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb, and your homes will be made a rubbish heap. So any comments about verse 5, that nice verse? Verse 6, but... If you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. The king repeats his ultimatum. This time he uses a carrot and not a stick. If the Chaldeans and his advisors will both declare the dream and then give the interpretation, they will receive both great honor and reward. So he gives the ultimatum twice in this verse. Declare the dream and its interpretation and be rewarded. Therefore, declare the dream and its interpretation. That's the, the structure of that sentence. Tell me what it says and you'll be rewarded. Now tell me what it says. Tell me what it is. These ancient advisors always made great claims about their abilities. The king was prepared to put those abilities to the test, not just to test the wise men, but to be certain, at least in his own mind, that he was getting the truth. Because if they could actually tell him what he dreamed and then tell him what the dream meant, if someone did that to you, you dream something. I know you wouldn't do this, but try and put yourself in this, in this setting. You dreamed a long, elaborate dream and you asked somebody, what did my dream meant? And they told you the dream and what it meant and you never told them anything. Wouldn't that make you sit up and take notice? Well, it ain't going to happen. No, I'm just... <laughs> That is not how God speaks to us today. But this is, this, is, this is a good plan. If you're a ruler who really needs to know what's going on about this dream and you're used to being lied to, this is a good plan. So they answered a second time and said, tell the dream, let the king tell the dream to his servants and we will declare the interpretation. This would have been a very brave move on their part. Um, it would have been akin to disregarding the king's first command. 
The fact is, though, they had nothing to lose. They had nothing to lose at this point. If he didn't tell them the dream, they knew their supposed divination was fake and they were going to die. The word translated servants refers to a slave. They were reminding the king when they said this, tell the dream to his slaves, that they were at his beck and call and they desired to do everything he wanted and he just needed to help them out a little bit here. If the wise men assumed that the king had forgotten his dream, it seems like they would have attempted some interpretation, but they didn't. So it appears they at least maybe assumed that he hadn't forgotten the dream. And thus the translation, which makes the statement that his command firm, that in the earlier verse, this that his command was firm, seems much more accurate, a much more accurate one. They were not certain he had forgotten it. So if they just declared some interpretation and it didn't even begin to line up, they were going to die. That's what he wanted. He wanted an accurate interpretation. So, verse 8, the king replied, <laughs> this is what I would have replied, I know for certain that you're bargaining for time. Inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm, the thing is gone from me. What has gone out from me is firm. The king saw through their artifice and he made a final demand. He would not allow them to continue delaying the fulfillment of the responsibilities to him. Here again, the King James Version implies that the king had forgotten the dream. It just implies it. It doesn't say that he did. Even, even had the king forgotten the dream, though, he most likely would have recognized a complete fabrication. I, I remember, I was trying to think this through. Um, I've had dreams, and... Uh, that when I got up the next morning, and, and no, not prophetic, just dumb. And I got up the next morning and didn't, I knew I had dreamed, but I didn't remember what it was. And then some things happened throughout the day and I kind of connected with some of the dream the night before, maybe not the whole thing. So there's always that danger too, that even if the king had forgotten his dream and they started talking, they would have known about all this. They were dream interpreters that he would have begun to remember what he had dreamed and he would know they were lying. So there were all these, all these, uh, implications in this situation that the uh, Chaldeans, I guess would be the Chaldeans, were aware of. we got to be very careful here because this guy can kill us at the drop of a hat. So, and frankly, were the wise men actually able to tell the dream, be, like I said, even be able to begin telling him the dream, it likely would have con triggered a memory and he would have remembered it. So, so then verse 9 continues on. That, let me, let me, let me read verse 8 and 9 together. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time inasmuch as you have seen that I, the command from me is firm, that if you do not make this dream known to me, there is only one decree for you, for you have joint, you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. The, f the verse finishes the statement begun in verse 8. The king is convinced that the wise men are stalling for time because they are liars and they are corrupt. That's what he says. You're stalling for You're bargaining for time so that you can wait till things change, till something changes, and you can get put one over on me again. That's not happening. They may have been hoping that the king would forget the dream if they stalled for time. It may have become evident to the wise men that the king remembered at least enough to spot a fabrication. Um, in his commentary... Walvoord puts it this way. He says, The king's accusation implied that he remembered the main facts of the dream well enough to detect any invented interpretation that the wise men might offer. It seems clear that Nebuchadnezzar was not willing to accept an any easy interpretation of his dream, but he wanted proof that his wise men had divine sources of information beyond the ordinary. They were supposedly, when they translated and interpreted these dreams, these wise men, the tradition had developed that they were supposedly conferring with the gods. They had access to the gods and were getting information directly from divine sources. That's what it had, that is the ethos that had developed over the centuries. And the king knew this. If they were going to be able to interpret this dream, they're going to claim that it's coming from the gods. I need to know that I'm really getting an accurate interpretation. So then the Chaldeans are starting to get a little bit more practical here. I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to die. What am I going to say? No matter what I say, I'm going to get torn limb from limb. So, and when you argue with the king in these days, he kills you. 
When you do the wrong, with a, wrong thing for a king in these days, he kills you. I'm going to try something. So, here's what the Chaldeans said. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king, inasmuch as no king, no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, conjurer Chaldean. That's the uh, ancient version of, We ain't never done it this way before. And the king was having none of it. Here the Chaldeans begin their explanation to the king, showing that there's no way they could do this. You're asking an impossibility. They almost berate the king for asking. They state that no king has ever asked anything of this of an advisor. Maybe they hoped to in some way plant shame in him into being more reasonable, cause him to be shamed into being more reasonable. That I don't know. I don't know exactly what was going on there. But uh, they must have been terrified. As we will see when we get to verse 12, it was a mistake because they only ser- it only served to excite his anger. Moreover, they said, verse 10 and 11 together, the Chaldeans answered the king in verse 10 and said, there is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conqueror, or conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult, and there is no one else who could declare it to the king except gods whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. Okay. Let's stop there for a minute. So if the king knew that the tradition was, if he got a correct interpretation or a good interpretation of his dream, it was because the people that were interpreting it for him got their information from the gods. He knew that. That's what he believed. They can't do it. They're just repeating what he already knows, that the only way anyone who could interpret this from you for you The only way anyone could interpret this for you is if they actually got their information from the gods. So all of that is, what is that doing? This is a beautiful, they're teeing it up for Daniel, for the sovereign God of the universe to interpret this dream for Daniel so that the king will know he's getting the true interpretation and we will have scripture to read. So this is in their mistaken attempt to escape an impossible situation The Chaldeans actually make the situation worse. If, in fact, they were privy to the counsels of the gods, as they claimed, receiving the dream and its interpretation should have been a simple for such a one connected to the divine. This only proves to the king that they were lying. Interestingly enough, as I said, it also sets the stage for Daniel to truly be able to give, and what's important to remember about the book of Daniel is one of the primary purposes of the book of Daniel, is to give honor and glory to God. Because he is the arbiter and the destroy and the controller of all of destiny of every nation. And so this is setting it up for that. It's just a marvelous, it's marvelous. So it proves to the king they're lying. It also sets the stage for Daniel to be, be able to truly give great honor to Jehovah God when he actually does exactly what the king requests. Even the sinister machinations of men can be used by God to glorify himself. No matter what men are doing today to try and tear down the kingdom of God, our sovereign God will use those as tools to glorify himself. So don't ever fear about that. Never fear about that. Verse 12, because of this, the king became indignant and very furious. I don't know what that meant. Did he st- throw, take his shoe off and throw it or something? And he gave orders to destroy all of the wise men of Babylon. So it's difficult to say whether this was a, tra- a tantrum or not, but it most certainly resulted in the king deciding to kill all of the wise men, including some who are not even present that day. Have you ever been in a situation where you didn't know who was in fault and so you had to punish all the kids? And the innocent kids didn't feel very good about that. (laughs) I don't know what they did, if they did a Daniel thing or not. I wasn't there. But but, uh, so this Daniel and his three friends had nothing to do with this. They weren't even present at the time. And they're going to be hunted down to be killed. The word translated indignant implies anger. And the word translated very furious implies a heightened wrath. This was an explosion the king had. What the king, as I put it down, was, was really torqued. He was torqued. Everyone, you're all going to die. Everyone's going to die. I can imagine the guards in the room are probably just standing there going, I hope it doesn't extend us. 
we just we're just we're just guards, King. We 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 don't do anything. We're not doing any of this dream consoling consulting. Two modern sentiments. Uh, to modern sentiments, this would seem. Hey, my homonym worked out here. Remember we talked about it's printed T W O because I use I use uh, tr- I dictate. I'm not a very fast typer. I dictate my Sunday schools and I have to go back through and correct things. That's why you see me circling stuff all the time. Dragon thought I said T W O. Two modern sentiments. No, two modern sentiments or forward two modern sentiments. This would seem like a great injustice. Why should individual counselors who were not present that day suffer with those who were conspiring to mislead the king? So Nebuchadnezzar may not have thought this through very well. And his anger, that his anger should have been directed at the wise men who were misleading him. His anger was directed at all wise men because he knew they were all fakes. If these guys are fakes, everybody's a fake. Um, let us not do that. Let us not be people who paint with such a broad brush especially if we're people whose lives hang in the balance. Yes? That's what would... I'm sure that's what Nebuchadnezzar eventually at that time or later... Aren't they admitting the question was asked? <laughs> aren't, they admit, aren't they admitting the question was asked that all interpretations of dreams were fake? And in, implicitly, yes. I believe that is what was coming forth here. I think Nebuchadnezzar kind of knew this. He, he had seen what had been done with his father. We, we've watched people be given misleading and inf- incorrect information and not really known what to do about it, had to stand back and just kind of let it take its course. So I, again, this is not written in scripture. This is just my surmising. I'm thinking that Nebuchadnezzar had seen this. This proved it to him. And in fact, now I need to get rid of all these people, all of them, because they're all liars. And all they will do is lie to me and misuse, misuse me. So everybody's going to die. <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking this through. Didn't, Nebuchadne- didn't it say, it did say, that Nebuchadnezzar actually spent individual time with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, so he would have known them, you know, at least um, cursorily. He would have known a little bit about them. Didn't matter. They're all going to die. Everyone. Now, I don't know how many that was, but I, I'm thinking it was quite a few. So... Um, He knew they were all fakes. Clearly, this is setting it up for the sovereign Lord God of the universe to show something to Nebuchadnezzar and to all the people. So finally, verse 13, So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. Daniel and his friends were included in the edict of destruction, not because they have practiced divination, as some have conjectured, but rather because they were among the, the... coterie of advisors to the king. And he was rejecting all of them. Everybody that is involved with this kind of chicanery is going to die. I'm going to cleanse my kingdom of falsehood. That's probably what he thought. So that is not to say that the king was necessarily rejecting the idea of soothsayers, dream interpreters, sorcerers, and astrologers. Rather, he was just convinced that the group that he had at the present was corrupt to the core, and he needed to replace them. Though it is not entirely clear whether the king's edict was to kill the counselors right where they stood, it is likely that it was rather to gather them, at least this is what most uh, interpreters and people down through history have thought. It was his, his intention was rather to gather them all together and then have a ceremonial killing so that everybody, so that it would strike terror into the heart of people. How's he going to get a soothsayer now? <laughs> Yeah, I want a whole bunch of new advisors and we're going to have a three-year training and, and you're going to be put into this training and after three years you're going to advise the king and if you make the slightest mistake, you will be torn limb from limb. Oh yeah, I want to do that. That sounds like a great job with great possibilities. What? I wonder if I'll get a 401k. Yeah, the K stands for kill. Though it is not entirely clear whether it's like I say, whether he was going to kill them on the spot, it looked more like it would be a ceremonial kill him. Killing. So Daniel then has the time to ask the questions that he will ask and see, seek an opportunity to actually serve the king. And it is Daniel's, and when we get to it, so this is all, if you will, I, what I call a Jehovah setup. The Lord God set this all up so that when, when Daniel has his opportunity to come in and speak to the king and actually interpret the dream, there will be no doubt in Nebuchadnezzar's mind that this is a true, a true interpretation, and we end up with Scripture. It's just an exciting thing. 
Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.